First of all, I must elevate a protest against the president and the chancellor for having deprived all of us of the human right to the siesta, the after dinner sleep. If anybody of you wants to sleep, I understand this. You are kindly requested not to snore. And now, um, education for love, for love in the family and beyond. We start with Kant. In his groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, Immanuel Kant explains to us what is a moral subject. Uh, and a moral subject is somebody who includes in, defi in the definition of his own good, the good of others, the good of all other human beings. And not just the material good, but the good intended in the sense of the right of being free subject. So the respect of the freedom of the other. The other has a right of having uh, purposes and, and of pursuing them. Um, and Kant presupposes that all human beings are moral subjects, which is not empirically true. Several years after Kant, the School of Frankfurt, in particular Max Horkheimer, um, made an inquiry into the empirical conditions for the constitution of the human subject. One becomes human subject, uh, Professor Donetti would say, through relations. And the relations through which one becomes a human subject are uh, the relations that we find within the family. The structure of the family conditions the formation of the moral subject. And, of course, uh, different family structures produce different kinds of moral subject. And the collapse of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, these structures uh, produce also a collapse of the moral subjectivity of the individuals and of society. The first step for, well, it really it is a circular process, but let us say the first step uh, in the constitution of the human subject and the falling in love. We find this also in Plato, in the Symposium and in the Phaedrus. To fall in love is to be uh, under the spell of a theia mania, a divine folly. Your um, emotional center is put out of yourself in somebody else. No. Professor Donati is ready to correct me. He wants to say, not in the other, between you and the other, in the tension that creates the relation between you and the other. You know, I have interiorized the uh, Professor Donati. <laughs> <laughs> this is the experience, the original experience, through which um, moral subjectivity is constituted. I cannot think of my own good without encompassing the good of my wife. And I cannot know what I think and what I will unless I know what she thinks and what she will. I don't always do what she wants, but I don't know what I want until I know what she wants. I am constituted in the relation to, uh, to my wife. So falling in love is a fundamental moment in the constitution of the moral subject. And of course, uh, our society tends to tell to the people, well, uh, falling in love is just an emotional fact. Don't take it too seriously. Uh, it will end. Uh, and um, on the contrary, the constitution of the moral subject is linked to the idea that there is a kind of permanence. Um, but there is another level in this constitution of the moral subject, and this takes place again in the family. Because uh, when two a man and a woman fall in love after a certain time, usually, from sexual intercourse. Children are born, not always, but often. And the child is constituted in the same way in the relation to the mother. Uh, we have two processes. Two become one, and I and the Tao become a we. But on the other hand, a subject becomes two. 
the mother becomes mother and child. Uh, and we become subjects differentiating ourselves from the undifferentiated uh, uh, complex mother-child uh, in time. It is an experience. And by the way, also the father has a certain role in this, because the father is the one who severs the child from the mother. The child learns that the mother does not belong to him, the mother belongs to the father, and then he constitutes himself interiorizing father and mother, and starting after a certain time the search for another woman with whom he may constitute again a we, not ceasing to be a we with his father and mother, differentiating himself, but also maintaining a grown-up relationship to the, uh, uh, to the family of origin. Um, uh, we are indebted to Sigmund Freud for having uh, investigated in depth this uh, process through which uh, the, 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 the moral subjectivity is constituted through the interiorization of the relation to the father and the mother. Well, uh, there is a, a further step. If you go to the Symposium of Plato, you see at a certain point that uh, uh, a deuteragonist enters into the dialogue. After Socrates and the beautiful speech of the women of Mantinea, Diotima, you have Alcibiades. Alcibiades thinks that uh, uh, Socrates is in love to him and wants to sleep with Socrates. But Socrates says, no, it is true that I am in love with you, but what I love is your soul, not your body. There is a distinctive experience uh, through which we pass from the constitution of a we that is limited to a certain number of people who are emotionally significant to us to the constitution of a we that encompasses the all of mankind. I can be in love only with one woman. I can have only one family. But in the family, I learn the attitude that allow me to become brother to all uh, women and all men of this earth. Of course, um, in this, the sexual drive is extremely important. But nevertheless, the process does not stop with the sexual drive. Already, in the relation to the children, the sexual drive is profoundly modified, and in relation to other people, is further modified. We move from, uh, uh, Nigren would say, from eros to agape. I do not agree. Uh, the word eros encomp may encompass also this uh, other dimension. By the way, Ratzinger has maintained this opinion. But in any case, uh, the moral subject is constituted through the original experiences made in uh, the family. A fundamental step is when one grows up and uh, he becomes conscious of his sexuality. Um, Karol Wojtyła has said that uh, the root of all sexual ethics is the problem. How can I make use of the body of another person respecting her or his dignity as a human person? There are some conditions that allow us to uh, enter into this relation respecting the dignity of the other. What is the dignity of the other? The fact that she or he is a person, as well as I am. There is a traditional set of norms regulating human sexuality. Um, they, to a large extent, depend on uh, one problem. We want to know who has to take care of the child. In traditional societies, you have the, the first problem that you have is to be sure who is the father. To be sure who is the father, you need to have an exclusive sexual relation between uh, two persons. In, in polygamy, uh, it is different, but not too much different. You have a plurality of, uh, uh, we might say, Oedipal triangles that have one uh, point in common. And from this necessity, 
All other elements depend. We must add another element that has been investigated by Claude Lévi-Strauss, that is uh, the prohibition of incest. It is extremely important because through the prohibition of incest, women become the, fa the, the, the element that puts in connection with one another uh, different uh, family groups. Uh, the child is the son of the father, but also of the mother. And uh, his siblings are the siblings on the side of the father and also on the side of the mother. Um, in uh, uh, the Spanish tradition, this is uh, uh, pointed out through the fact that the child has the family name of the father and also of the mother, both of them. And now we have an injury. We changed the law. Uh, and, and in this way, you create a, a broader community. The child is part of two different groups, and it is the basis for the formation of what the Greeks called etne. I don't know how we could translate it in, in, in English. Tribe, but not quite. Anyway, all this structure that stands at the basis of the traditional uh, sexual norms um, is put in question by the discovery of uh, uh, easy uh, functional instruments that uh, allow us to sever the enjoyment of sex from the conception of children. The sexual revolution uh, consists exactly in the fact that we, you can have uh, with relatively uh, certainty enjoyment of sex that is not connected to the generation of children. Um, the result is that adultery, ah, that is not too bad after all. If you make sure you don't make a child with uh, your occasional partner, it is not too bad. And uh, chastity in order to prepare yourself to living uh, only with one spouse, it is equally not, not, not so relevant. And the, the word love changes meaning. It is reduced to emotional involvement. Until you have the emotional involvement, you have love. When there is no more emotional involvement, when another emotional involvement arises, then you have not love anymore. And um, the, uh, you lose the idea that in love, there is another element, the element of decision. I make a decision. I take in front of God the responsibility of being a privileged witness of the love of God to this person throughout life. Um, the sexual revolution had a different um, sexual norm. Um, it was, after all, everything is consent. After a while, and we were convinced that sex is always good, Make love, not war. After a while, we have begun conscious of the fact that perhaps we had gone too far. Take um, a different formulation of the principle. Uh, everything is consented if uh, it takes place between two consenting adults. It is already something different, because you presuppose that they must be adults. Uh, and this means, for instance, that pedophilia is bad, is wrong. Um, we will later say a few words on the reasons why it is wrong. But um, uh, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s, those of us who are old enough to remember, uh, I remember that uh, um, Jean-Paul Sartre, Michel Foucault, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and um, a large number of the most prominent French intellectuals uh, put their uh, name under a petition for the legalization of pedophilia in France. And in Germany, in Germany, uh, Monsignore, uh, no, uh, he's no more here. Anyway, uh, in Germany, we had um, a proposal of uh, Joska Fischer, of Con Bendia, for the legalization of pornography. Professor Battiani, no, he's too young to remember, but anyway, may have read about it. So we have made a first step 
towards a reinstitutionalization of sex. And uh, we find uh, something similar also, for instance, in the Me Too movement. Um, look at the Me Too movement. It begins with the fact that some women had been raped in the traditional sense of the word. Then it goes on. Many women protest, not because they were raped in a technical sense, but because they realize that their consent was not valid because they were not respected. Then we enter into a process of search for a new moral. What is the answer of the church to this process? The first answer was that of Paul VI. Um, Paul VI, with Humane Vitae, uh, produced a, a prophetic document. If we sever um, sexuality from childbearing and from procreation, the result in the long run will be uh, the disruption of society. Uh, as a, I've been a politician for 24 years, one of the consequences politicians are more sensible to is the fact that we have no, no more a sufficient number of young people to pay um, taxes and contributions, to pay pensions, and to pay for uh, the health care of the old people. The number of the people in the world is shrinking. We have lived for a long time with the perception uh, that, oh, we are too many on this earth. Professor Dumont has explained that this is false. The earth, to a large extent, is not inhabited, and in any case, the number of people is shrinking. Um, and um, by the way, the largest part of the resources of the earth is not consumed by the large number of the poor, but the, by the sumptuous lifestyle of the rich. In this sense, Humane Vitae was prophetic, wanted to maintain this connection. Um, I uh, sometimes explain Humane Vitae saying that when you are 20 years old, the most fascinating part of sex is intercourse. When you are 40, you become aware that the most fascinating part of sex children. When you are 70, I am 73, you become aware of the fact that the most fascinating part of sex are grandchildren. But today, in order to arrive to this point, you must have the wisdom of a man of 70 when you are 20, because otherwise you will have no children. We must say, however, that Humane Vitae was a pastoral disaster. Um, it was a pastoral disaster because uh, the defenders uh, of Humane Vitae had an approach to sexuality and marriage that clearly had become obsolete. They defended the old rule without being able to explain to the young people why it was good for them to comply with that old rule. On the other hand, the critics of uh, Humane Vitae had no proposal, had the proposal only to accept the sexual revolution as it was. And they did not take into account all the things that have been uh, explained in this uh, one and a half day. That is, uh, that uh, uh, women uh, now must work and have a job out of the home, um, that uh, they have a right to the expansion of their personality, uh, uh, and so forth. St. John Paul II has given us one fundamental correction. He has explained uh, from within of the experience of sexuality that uh, the old norms did not only defend the certainty of the individuation of the father, they had also another function to allow a man and a woman to enter in relation with one another, constituting a we, an I, thou, and a we, an alliance for life. And through this, 
they became fully moral subjects. Um, the traditional social bonds, the traditional family bonds, uh, enter into a crisis uh, because of individualism. But on the other hand, the conscious and the responsible individual is the result exactly of the family in which there is one father, one mother, and some siblings. Uh, the dominant trends in uh, the cultural industry, in the mass media, in the show business, have been overwhelmingly against the, uh, uh, the, um, the traditional uh, sexual norms. And when one is young, I already say this, the attraction of unrestricted sex is normal. And we must consider the fact that many couples cannot reasonably afford more than a limited number of children. And natural family planning under circumstances can become unreliable or otherwise fairly impractical. It is not easy to sleep side by side with a beloved person and remain thoroughly inactive. We stand in need of a retrenchment. I think the retrenchment is uh, um, conditioned by the fact that we are moving from a society in which certain moral norms were universally accepted to a society in which these norm moral norms have to be rediscovered. Does ethics change? No, ethics does not change. But uh, the human nature does not change. But St. Thomas Aquinas explains us in the Summa Theologiae, question 94 of the Prima Secunde, article uh, 4, 5, and 6, that there is nature and there is a second nature. Society constitutes a second nature. And the second nature uh, can have the force of the original nature. He makes the example of the Germans. Is anybody, any German here? No, I don't see any. Nobody. Well, he makes the example of Germans, and he says, well, in Germany, theft is not considered as uh, a, a sin, an evil. And people who live within that culture will not learn that theft is bad. In the same way, today, we live in a society in which many uh, norms uh, uh, are uh, in the field of sexuality are not universally recognized. And a young man who learns from his family, he learns from TV, who learns from internet, will not feel them as norms that are significant for him. Then, and this idea of St. Thomas is further developed by St. John Paul II in the concept of social sin or social structure of sin. Does this mean that St. Thomas is a relativist? Not at all. But he says, coscientia erronea obligat. What you uh, see in your conscience obliges you. And if your conscience is wrong, you must act according to your wrong conscience. Because the last judge of human act is human conscience. Is this relativism? No. Because what you do is wrong. Innocence said no chance. You are subjectively innocent. But objectively, what you do is bad. That's two minutes. Well, so we need a retrenchment. A retrenchment means that uh, we have to make a choice. Shall we defend uh, the old rules, um, not entering into the situation of consciousness of the young people of today, or shall we enter into that? existential situation, helping them to find out again uh, the norms that may be in content the same as the old norms, but will be different because they will be retrieved through a new experience. I wish to end, those who want can read all the text, I wish to end with one example. There is a movie uh, that is uh, uh, extremely uh, full of content, and in one sense, give us an example of what I've been trying to say. I don't know how many of you have read, uh, have, have seen Pretty Woman. 
I imagine many of you did. I did with my daughters. At, in the beginning, you are in the middle of the sexual revolution. There is uh, uh, a, a young man, very rich young man, who uh, uh, enters into relation with a hooker. Is there on the road, and it takes her, a prostitute, and they have sex. After a while, they fall in love. When they fall in love, they feel that that beginning was wrong. And he does not accept to see her treated as a hooker, and uh, she does not want to be treated as such. And they part. She leaves him. Is this the end? No. That is the end of the first part. She wants to be appropriately worked. She wants to establish a relation of a person to a person. She wants to have a kind of contract. Uh, and they begin again. Um, it is wrong to imagine that young people today are amoral. They do not feel the need of a new morality. We must stand with them and uh, find together with them uh, the road towards a new morality, new formally, although, as what regards the content, to a large extent, it might even coincide with the old moral system. Thank you for your attention, and I consider an important success the fact that nobody seems to be asleep. <laughs>